What's up, Kurt? What's up, buddy? How you doing? Not much. You? Good. How was good the Arnold? It was cool. Yeah. Was cool, Saw your picks. Looked like you had yeah, it was a good time. Hello. All right. We got we got Kurt Havens. We got Eric Seifert. Eric Seifert is my trainer. He's also my MAT practitioner. So we're going to talk today nice. about training. Kurt Havens has a PhD in uh, endocrinology. And he, oh, wow. Nice. He has a book on HGH, which is really awesome as well. So we're going to have a good chat today, I think. Well, I nice. know we are. I know we are. Um, Eric, you're filling out those sleeves there on that, that shirt. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying. I'm trying. There you go. So yeah. you live, just wear smaller you guys clothes. Just wear smaller clothes. That's been ever. <laughs> yeah, it's it's funny because uh, you know, Eric, I think you're not even trying to get, you know, bigger and more muscular. You just are because you've been training with me and not training with me, but training me and training alongside me and all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. But you know, um, you know, you you lift a lot of weight too, so that you got to have some muscle to move a lot of weight, you know? You can't just yeah, move, yeah. I, you know? I just try and focus on being strong, you know what I mean? Strong, healthy. Yeah. The rest of the stuff kind of just comes with it. Yeah. Yeah. So, <clears throat> all right. So today, I want to talk about, obviously, training. I have a bunch of questions from the listeners as well, but um, Big Mo's joining us as well, so. Nice. Bing, bing. I have to turn that on because people join at different times. Some people are late. Right. You know, someone will join like 20 minutes in and we're having a conversation. If it doesn't ding, then I won't, I won't even realize someone joined. Oh, you won't let so, them in or whatever, right? I won't let them in. <laughs> so, you cannot so, get in. Big Mo. What's up, guys? What's up? What's, What's up, up, Mo? Not much. Same old. I feel like two of us in glasses and two of us with hats. We've got it all figured out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I wear glasses too. I'm just not wearing them. Yeah. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, Eric, I want to give you the proper introduction, um, but I don't want to get it wrong. So, please help me out here if I do. Sure. But you are the owner of Core Muscle Activation. You're also a practitioner for MAT, Muscle Activation Techniques, and you're also yes. a teacher, um, master MAT practitioner and teacher. And then, can you please help me out to continue? Um, so just, well, my background or just sort of, yeah, I mean, at, at some point it's just strength yeah. coach, therapist, uh, manual, manual therapist. Uh, I teach for the American program. I'm the only Canadian instructor in the program for muscle activation techniques. Um, yeah. Business owner. I, yeah, that's it. <laughs> work with champion athletes, work with Olympian athletes, uh, yeah. um, Ben Pakulski is the one yeah. who actually got me interested in working with Eric Seifert. So when I was following Ben, he was kind of in the peak of his career. He talked about Eric Seifert as being one of the gentlemen who had helped him get to the Olympia and get to as far as he did. So I was, you know, okay, well, who is this guy? I got to learn more about him. And then, you know, I talked more about uh, Eric with Ben and eventually ended up uh, having Eric come to Pure, meet him at Pure, get a chance to start working with him. That was in 2021. We started working together <clears> and <throat> we've been working together uh, pretty much every week ever since then. Mm -hmm. And it's been awesome because I've, you know, made a ton of gains. I've also had a ton of injuries that you helped me with. I've gotten over a lot of injuries, um, tendonitis, things like that. I've gotten a lot stronger. So yeah, basically this, this conversation here, I think today could be really useful because we have so many questions about training from, you know, beginners to even advanced athletes like me and Mo. Kurt, I don't know if you're the same, but, you know, <clears> we're <throat> always trying to learn, obviously, right? So we don't know. Yeah, um, we don't we're know. trying to advance our, our training to the next level as well, right? So, yeah. Mm. Thanks for coming on, Eric. Really appreciate it. Oh, absolutely happy to hear. Um, where do you guys want to start this? Well, I want to start with questions. In, in, I'm actually interested in just, like, you know, Eric's background a little bit and, like, how – because I only know Eric from Pure and just, like – being like, you know, a master trainer, helping out everybody. But like, I know you have obviously like extensive like education and, and experience like with what you do. So, and just for our viewers as well, like just talk about that a little bit. Yeah. So um, it's funny to kind of go different circles in your career. I started off um, 
kind of just being the most educated. I mean, if you lived in a gym as a football player, you're just kind of the most educated guy in the gym if you went to school. And and so uh, I'm so old, <laughs> personal training didn't really exist back then. And uh, it sort of was just in its infancy in Toronto. And then I got kind of exposed like, hey, you do all this programming and you do all the, write all these programs for people and you take people through and fit people on equipment so much. Um, one of my girlfriends at the time said, you know, there's this place that's just training people. And I was like, well, what do you mean just training people? And, and it was this very small boutique, uh, you know, like personal training studio down in Toronto. And uh, it was like, oh, you get paid to, to tra- you know, take people through one on one. Like, so I got a job. I was the second highest paid trainer there at $12 an hour. <laughs> You know, um, the highest level guy was getting paid 14. So, you know, that was like, I wasn't going to bump him out. Um, but pretty soon, you know, I kind of outgrew that. And then I, I created my own business very quickly. And I was in, you know, kind of north of Toronto and bouncing around from gym to gym to gym. And then I ended up moving into a kind of a downtown gym, went to general population, really. Um, I kind of thought from general population, maybe I wanted to get into sports. I was working with more injured kind of people and I got a chance to whip out to sports. And so I kind of went the strength coach route and I went into the OHL for one of the first strength coach positions that they had. And I worked in Guelph and we did really well. Um, And then I kind of realized that was more like babysitting than I really wanted to do. And there's no real career in the NHL. There's no real career not to put this down, but there's, there's quite a ceiling in terms of what you're going to expect to be a strength coach. Um, More and more now there's some opportunities, but for the most part, most of them, you know, I could out earn them. I could out earn what a strength coach is making in the NHL, you know, kind of in private. So that didn't make any sense to me. Um, and then luckily kind of a little further along the road, I got exposed to this therapy and that kind of shifted a whole huge amount of my focus. Um, I was already kind of dealing with all kinds of mechanical stuff and sports performance, but then I, I kind of got pushed down a different road with the, with becoming a therapist. And, you know, that kind of took me off the, out of the training world. Um, and so I've kind of gone in and out of all these different sports and, you know, it's kind of funny to come back to pure now and be there for the last two years. And it's almost like, where does this guy come from? You know, because I, I've been, I've worked in major league baseball. I've worked in, in the NBA. I've worked in the NFL. You know, I just haven't had time for bodybuilding. You know, it's almost like I was with the bills for the last three years before COVID and then uh, COVID hit and all of a sudden there's no, outside uh contractors in the building and all of a sudden pure presents itself as an opportunity and all of a sudden hey i'm back into bodybuilding you know if i'm playing with football players i have no time for you know i have no time for another office you know dealing with bodybuilding so um but i thought oh my gosh i'm trading off huge athletes to more huge athletes (laughs) like large humans to large humans and uh but bodybuilding has always been something that i've had a real passionate about uh, in terms of just, I'm very passionate about it because the athletes, just like football players, every athlete I've worked at in the high level, Olympians, uh, World Tour, beach volleyball, they're all going to play, right? At the end of the day, bodybuilders are going to lift. And so just like football players, they're going to do anything they can to keep playing. And so when you kind of fall in love with the athlete, you know, regardless of the process, it's, it's really pretty easy to keep trying to help everybody you know one of the nicest things i see about pure is is very little ego most people just want to get better you know and for a coach to to walk into an environment where everybody just wants to work hard and and if you can help them work harder they're all ears you know that's that's sort of like a a sweet spot for any coach Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah for sure that's awesome so when you're when you're at pure you're kind of using your therapy and you're using your training uh 50 50 now so a lot of guys are coming to you when they either hurt themselves or they have an issue, um, you know, tendonitis, things like that. Would you say that more people are coming to you for training or more people are coming to you for therapy? Um, and- uh, yeah, sorry. So now when I first started, because generally most people saw me on the floor with with obviously the pro level bodybuilders, most people didn't even know I'm a, I'm a therapist. And so it's kind of funny, my world in Toronto in a clinic setting, I'm primarily a therapist that 
you know, they get surprised when they go in the gym and like, oh, you do stuff in here too. And then in, you know, I go to Pure and most people see me on the gym floor and they're like, oh, you're a therapist. So I kind of get to switch gears quite a bit. And, and when I'm in Pure now, there's a few more people that have issues. But my bigger thing is if I can solve it on the gym floor, you know, a lot of times I'll help somebody with the mechanics of an exercise and they're like, wow, I can, I can, I can actually feel where I'm supposed to feel it. You know, my triceps feel great, but I, my, my elbow doesn't hurt, you know, if we line it up properly. Wow. I, you know, I didn't have to, like a lot of bodybuilders, I think, think, oh, everybody's elbows hurt with this exercise, but I get big arms. So who cares? <laughs> you know, it's kind of that trade off of I'm willing to do this. I'll pay that ticket to get that prize. And a lot of times they're surprised that maybe they can get that prize without having to pay that ticket, you know? Yeah. So obviously, in your opinion, the ideal is to have a combination of MAT therapy with, you know, obviously biomechanically correct training. So, you know, that's kind of what I do with you. I come to you, you know, you know, when I want to hurt myself, things like that, we do therapy. We're also training. Um, it, it, in your opinion, is that the ideal as opposed to someone, because it kind of bridges the gap, right? So as opposed to someone going out to someone else, getting other types of therapy, coming back to you. Mm -hmm. going back to someone else coming back to you and maybe there's a there's an issue that's maybe not being solved there you can kind of help to <clears throat> bridge that gap and solve that problem whether it's on the table or in the the gym because you're doing both yeah. i think that's pretty unique yeah if you think of sometimes so keep in mind every every tool in the toolbox is a different tool right you want to build ikea with just the 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 allen wrench key thing you're like i can't i need something else too so a lot of times um i have chiropractors as clients and referral sources i have osteopaths i have massage therapists as clients physios as clients and referral sources it doesn't mean those tools don't work what happens though is sometimes there's like that tool is great but there's something left and so a lot of guys will invest in a lot of therapy because they're pushing their body really hard and from, from, if I'm the standalone, it doesn't mean those tools don't work. I'm a terrible chiropractor. I'm not very good at acupuncture. Those are amazing tools all by themselves, but I'm uh, maybe let's say a mechanic. If you think of me more like a mechanic and they're going to drive the car hard or they're going to want to drive the car hard. Right. And I'm going to check the car over first. And then I'm going to talk about driving lessons. Makes sense. So it's more about, about how am I going to, take a look at this car, see what they've done to it, see what it can do. That would be my table present, you know, sort of looking at stuff. And then from that, that amount of information you gather, now I can say, you know, here's their goals. Here's what they want to do. Now I can go on the gym floor and I'll be like, I bet this exercise has been hard for you. Mostly because I've gathered all that information on the table. Does that make more sense? Yeah. So we had a, a conversation about this before about different modalities for recovery, different techniques and tools if you were to list them in order, let's say someone's working with you, they're coming to you for training and MAT on the table, but they have some leftover cash and they want to invest in massage or chiro or acupuncture. They can't do everything, mm -hmm. but they sure. definitely want to do maybe one or two other modalities. Which ones would you say are the best or which ones would you rank uh, in order of most important? Well, so the challenge is not about the tool, but about the tool user, right? So you could have a chiropractic uh, you know, certificate and be called doctor and be amazing. Or you could have a chiropractic and be called doctor and not be that amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, so instead of the the which tool should they spend it on, I would be, you know, kind of thinking about um the bigger challenge is most the bigger challenge is mostly what did you want that tool to do? Mm -hmm. Right. And so a lot of times people go to the chiropractor, expect the chiropractor to do everything. They come to me, maybe expect me to do everything, you know, and a lot of times it's like, oh, there's a, there's a chiropractic solution here. But if I can get muscles working and your training is optimized, maybe you hold your chiropractic longer. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Right. Osteopaths, you get a whole different kind of big, um, you don't know what you get when you get an osteopath. Again, they can go off in all these other directions. They're quite varied. Yeah. Um, and massage, massage is kind of like a reboot. And, you know, a lot of times I think guys are, um, I'm going to sound judgmental here, but guys are overusing massage, 
you know, they're asking massage therapists to just grind them down and reboot everything when they could have just used it as a lymph system or recovery tool. Mm-hmm. You know, most people did seem so counterintuitive to do light massage, more mm-hmm. like a flush type stuff and let your, your nervous system calm down versus just go in and drop elbows, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes uh, sense. I've heard that too, because like I, I've even experienced this myself with like massage <clears throat> therapy that's like pretty painful, like almost unbearable. And sure. then I talked to an osteopath like after that experience that I had and the osteopath basically explained to me that like, it's going to be really hard for something to be beneficial if you're like fighting it the whole time it's getting done. Like, mm-hmm. you know, whereas massage should be kind of be, I guess there's different circumstances, of course, but massage should be somewhat like, you know, relaxing and, and mm-hmm. they're kind of keep the muscles more pliable. You shouldn't necessarily be being tr- like trying to like, you know, really break down muscle tissue and like cause this like crazy amount of like bruising and soreness and stuff like that it's kind of like counterproductive right Mm -hmm. yeah i mean it's funny i see there was a little community thing there where people using graston in the in the bodybuilding community and guys would be posting pictures of their their you know graston scars and you know all their bruising i'm like wait a minute are you trying to break down scar tissue and then all i'm seeing is you're showing me evidence of internal bleeding (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> i'm like seriously i'm not really sure what we're doing here you know right and so um now having said that i'm sure like anything there's a tool and a use for anything but i think when you get a big dude like you walking into massage i guarantee they're like oh okay let me sharpen my elbows <laughs> you know it's almost like they don't even listen to what you're saying about what you want they're just like oh i'm just gonna have to turn this guy into a dish rag wow how am i gonna do this you know I think and so you're gonna buy us big dudes right away to just like how can i crush this guy because he's so big you know and and i'm it's funny when i get a massage it's very rare but when i get a massage i just want to sleep i'm gonna relax and the funny part they ask me what i do and i say i'm a garbage man because nobody wants to talk about what I do if I tell them I'm a garbage man. But if I tell them I'm a manual therapist doing neuromuscular therapy, I get the worst massage I've ever got ever because they're talking the whole time. They want to show off. They want to do stuff they've never done anyone else. You know, they get really nervous. And I just want them to just like, I'd pay someone to kind of scratch my arm. Do you know what I mean? Like, (laughs) I would just want the lightest massage. I want to be asleep in 50 minutes, you know, right? And I want my nervous system to feel like, oh, I can just relax, right? They don't even have to be in the room by the time it's done, you know? (laughs) Yeah, That's a really good point, yeah. I mean, there's definitely, uh, there's there's a few massage therapists. We talked about this, Eric, you know, not, we're definitely not going to name names, but they wear it like a badge of honor if they can like, you know, do like something so un- almost unbearable to you. And then it's like, wow, now there's this trauma that I've left on this person. And I've done that before. And I used to think it was like hardcore, you know, I think like, oh yeah, the more pain, the better must be better for me. Cause I'm hardcore and tough, but mm-hmm. you know, I've also gone to massage therapist and fallen asleep. And I thought well, that was a waste of time. Cause I just fell asleep. But you're saying that this is way more beneficial and it makes complete sense. Because if I'm if I'm in pain and I remember one time I swear to you I feel like I my body was like looking like I feel like I had like a out of body experience from this person because it was in so much pain I had to literally it took everything to try to relax my body while breathing through it and I was like wow that was so intense um, you know and I never wanted to ever do that again that's yeah. the one thing I remember from that I was like I I don't think I could ever go through that again uh because i went in there unknowingly right so then i I got on the table i just like okay just get through it um but man you know that was like a real trauma right yeah same same with me man i would go to my massage therapy appointments and and like i'm not like i'm definitely not going to knock this person completely because they did do some stuff that helped me but i would be going into these things like with anxiety be like man i gotta get you're having a a panic attack because yeah Yeah. and then like right away it's like I'm not like, I'm trying to like do this for recovery. Like me going in there in like fight or flight mode is like the, <laughs> the last thing that like should be happening. Produce as much cortisol as possible. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, right? I'm just tensing up like every time he touches me because I have no idea like the scale of pain that I'm about to feel. It could be a two, it could be like a, a 12, <laughs> like, you know? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think it's just a funny thing that it's almost like a weird, you know, everybody has to sort of like suck it up buttercup and, and, you know, cut it 
to take the hardest massage you can possibly take. And then the funny part is I had a massage therapist taking a course of mine. And she said to me, she said to me, she's proudly wearing a sleeveless shirt, showing up her guns flaring, you know. And she said, if you're not sore for 24 to 48 hours after my massage, you don't really want a real massage. And I remember thinking, I you're literally the farthest thing from a massage therapist that I'd ever want to meet you know right like that's that's just lay there and get pummeled you know and so she said that that well that's not a real massage and so I thought wow that's just like ego gone wrong in the wrong direction you know well, it's like the same as personal trainers that get clients and I was like, just gonna say there's the parallel yeah, right yeah yeah they just want to like put them through the hardest leg day possible so they're throwing up when, when it's like a beginner that probably needed like six working sets like for the whole <laughs> to, to make progress like you know and uh yeah, it's just, yeah, it's one of those things. But Eric, I want to, like, what is something in your opinion that, because massage therapy is obviously like a tool, like you said, but yeah. in your opinion, what's something bodybuilders should be consistently doing for themselves just to keep, like, the muscle bellies pliable and things like that? Because obviously we're training four or five days a week. Like, you know, things are going to get bound up. So, like, what's your take on that? So I, I would say that that mobility work is is kind of a misunderstood thing um so if you think of gymnasts as an example or even sometimes dancers which you know most of us aren't thinking bodybuilder gymnast you know but if you're thinking about somebody that has to show strength right in gymnastics right now flexibility is a big deal but flexibility uh where you can literally hold a limb straight up above your head and stand there and look at the judge is literally showing them this sort of active strength does that make more sense when guys you see bodybuilders go down into the splits and just hold it and don't look like they kind of faked it to get down there. It's usually pretty impressive when you see athletes demonstrate like, like actual range of motion and strength, right? How well we move and transition. So I would say that active stretching, which is a funny thing to, to think about. Most of us learned from gym class was like passive stretching, right? Like, so you stretch your hamstring, you, so you stretch your quad, you lay there till it basically lets go. And the funny part is trying to, to understand that, that if you wanted to stretch your tricep, your bicep is doing a great job trying to shorten, right? So remember old tricep stretches, we'd be up here and have to just pull. The funny part is if you contract your bicep from two heads, it's like, wait a minute, that's shoulder flexion and elbow flexion at the same time. You'll feel your triceps going like, oh, I have to have a conversation. And so the difference between, you know, actually understanding how to contract into something versus how to stretch something, right, is, is sort of a, a, an understanding of isometrics and, and being able to contract stuff to shorten. So if I want to use my pecs to shorten, everything on the backside is actually what's lengthening. I'm yeah. feeling all the contracting of shortening things, but everything else is reciprocal, trying to tell the other side, if you want to shorten that much, these guys have to let go. And so for most people, they just beat again it's another version of beat the crap out of their Golgi tendon kind of reflex until it just forces it to let go and so i don't know how much muscle uh, nerve stuff you guys have but there's two main structures in 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 muscle Golgi tendon which most of us feel in the bellies very dense in the bellies and if somebody sticks their finger into a tight muscle it shuts off you can use the word relief right it starts to release and as it releases it lengthens and that's usually what we would call like a breaker switch. You go down and you hit the breaker and it just shuts off. And in doing so, it reboots. So there's nothing inherently wrong with that. But if you just said, man, I can't stretch enough. I can't stretch enough. It doesn't matter what I do. It's just tight, always tight. And it just beat on it and it's tight. I would say you're actually misunderstanding the, the tightness more as a, is now more a protection mechanism. Does that make more sense? Mm -hmm. And so muscle spindles is, is kind of where muscles start and muscle ends. And they're the ones that tell the, the muscle where it is lengthwise. And so when you have to shorten something all the way, something else is now saying, oh, I know what you're doing. You're going to have to learn to let go. But most people are just stretching the crap out of one side with no conversation on, on the other side of the muscle. And so it takes a little bit of a switch to feel like, well, what am I going to do to stretch my pec? Contract your back, okay? Contract your back. That makes your pecs release. If you want to think about, it kind of looks like everybody's doing it wrong, but if I wanted to stretch out my pec, most people are hanging on stuff because that's what they did in gym class, right? If I said, I need you to push, if you're on the floor and I say, push your shoulder through the floor till you rotate away, 
you'll feel like, wow, my back muscles, whatever those are, are contracting, but I almost feel this like a stretch. And that's what's called an active stretch. Now you're using these two to talk to each other. Does that make more sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No and so that would be, you know, again, guys aren't used to it. They're just used to just stretching the crap out of stuff. But this is when you see some of them might invest in doing yoga or these type of things. And even in yoga, there's a, there's potentially a bunch of passive stretchy positions. And usually what happens with guys that are really good at stretching or are already good at stretching, they like stuff that involves stretching. Guys that aren't really good at stretching, you know, really tight they tend to deflect away from it and then they go again just back to just beating stuff up you know almost with this sort of i gotta apparently this is something i have to do mm -hmm. and just like a massage they, they feel it feels terrible and they don't really see themselves getting better and then chances are yeah too much passive stretching not enough active range control okay so the uh basically so just breaking breaking that down making it super simple the pre-workout static stretching is no good because it's kind of like having a massage where you're shutting it down yeah. with, that, with that Golgi tendon. Yeah. But if we did some um, warm-up stuff like activation or yeah. going through an active stretch, now yeah. we're, we're shortening one muscle to lengthen the other. Now that's activating that muscle spindle. Yeah. And that's what we would want to do pre-workout. Yep. So now that makes if you sense. To do, if you wanted to do some passive stretching, let's say you, you kind of go, man, Eric sounds smart, but I don't know. But then I would say, great. Do it after your workout, before you leave. Most people aren't doing cool downs anymore. They just like pack it up and go. Or do it before you go to bed. If you want It'll to do be... some passive stretching and you really feel attached to it, there's nothing wrong with it. Just don't be crazy aggressive. And I would do it just before you go to bed. Because mm -hmm. any kind of stuff you shut off, you're going to bed. Your body has time to reboot everything and reset everything. And, and by the time you get up, I, maybe wow my mobility is a little better right yeah but i would not do it as a pre-workout you yeah. know preparation so the focus like what you have be usually doing pre-workout is contraction stuff maybe we're on the floor let's say we're doing like a hamstring or a leg day we might be doing an isometric uh hip thrust where we're really trying to activate those hamstrings mm -hmm. which is probably going to be lengthening out those hip flexors and stuff like that so yep. that's more preferred than doing a hip flexor stretch training yeah. but if we want to do hip flexor stretch we could definitely do that post training lightly to help with the recovery and that sure. would be that would and be if you ultimate. wanted if you wanted to stretch out your hip flexors what would you use actively we would, we would be using glutes and hamstrings and yeah, we would we'd be using yeah. we'd be using hip extensors right yeah to try and do that so most people just hang on the front of their hip and kind of push it forward i'm like like a, like a bad bulgarian Right. Mm -hmm. People do a Bulgarian and they lean on the back leg. And I'm like, and then the injury I see is somebody going, Yeah, I jammed up the front of my hip. I'm like, what were you doing? A Bulgarian. Wait, mm -hmm. which leg did you jam? Oh, I was leaning on the back leg. I'm like, oh. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So doing a ballistic, like a ballistic passive stretch without realizing it. Right. And um, do you know what extreme stretching is? Um, uh, anything you add i'm sure you can imagine <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to get this question i already know the answer eric but extreme stretching is something that people do as a post-workout way to you know increase the hypertrophy or something like that but basically what it is it's a loaded stretch where you're you're trying to push it basically almost to failure so for example for a quad stretch you'd be doing like a sissy squat where you're you're kind of you know in that stretch in the sissy squat and you're trying to push that a maximal stretch for like 60 seconds would that be something that you would say would be good for obviously not beginners but someone who's advanced or is that something you should definitely not do or another no, example would be like a loaded a loaded tricep like you're saying but you're using a dumbbell to load that tricep yeah so a loaded length in position is not a problem because the body still got to load there you have to be careful a little bit about the design of that exercise because I think there's sort of just, well, there's long and, you know, so I think if you just said loaded lengthening things, um, yeah, sure. I have no trouble with that. Um, you know, loading a lengthened muscle is, is kind of this massive overload thing where you're going to see growth factor for a lot of people argue about that. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. Um, but it's not really a stretch. Does that make sense? It's being, it's being kind of set up as a stretch, but it's more like control of full length and loaded position and just lay there, like sit in it, you know? Yeah. So I don't, I don't, would, I wouldn't call that extreme stretching. I would just say that's like a loaded 
lengthened position that you have to be able to control. So I, I would be fine with that. Yeah, that makes sense. What's your uh, take on like foam rolling, like for in general or pre workout? Muscle right? smushing? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, like, it's something I've done to help with my legs uh, because sure. like, I had like an IT band problem for a long time and I was getting massage done on it for like a year and no, like it wouldn't help at all. Like I was always having the same issues. And then I figured that out. So I started foam rolling my IT bands, my quads. Mm. And literally, as soon as I started doing that, my, all my issues went away and I could squat and leg press with like no pain. And so because of that, it's something I've kept in. Like usually for me, I'll foam roll like the day before I train legs and then I'll, yeah. foam, I'll, foam, I'll foam roll like pre-workout too, like very briefly, maybe for like a minute mm -hmm. 30 total. Uh, yeah. And I pretty much have had no issues with my leg training from doing that. But I just want to know, like from your perspective, is foam rolling like right before I train, like hindering my training in any way or? Yeah. So if I said, I'm going to give you one of those deep massages and you're going to go train, you're going to squat. You'd be like, uh, I don't, Ooh, I don't really know. You said a minute 30 of you kind of going through a, a, a series of patterns that you as an athlete has already identified. Right. And said, Hey, this, this actually is sort of the minimum stuff. I feel like I just want to have a little, a little bit of some light massage. Some guys are using little Theraguns, but they're on the lightest setting. Just and then now all you're really doing is opening up a lymph system. Okay. You're just pushing a lymph system to kind of say, here's some stress. Some people literally will do slapping. It sounds funny, but it's like the same thing yeah. that you're literally just moving the lymph system to kind of go, Hey, wake up. There's, there's some blood flow that has to happen in those areas. So that's not the same as sitting there with an app for an hour, like rolling stuff out till it basically gives up. Yeah. And then, as you said, as the athlete, what I would say the challenge is you've already kind of tested that. So I'm like, check mark. You've already tested that. You had a problem. You did a bunch of rebooting things, right? That you strategize through and you're able to sort of test and see, you know, okay. But if somebody said, Oh, I hear, that's good. I should do more of it. And I'm like, wait, you don't, do you have a problem? No, I just hear it's good. I'm like, well, again, we go back to here. Screwdrivers are good, but not for the wrench things, you know? So like, are you, you had a tool, you had a problem, you had a tool use, you had a strategy, you had feedback, all those things. And now you use that tool as, as a, as a, another tool, funny enough, as a lymph tool and you're good to go like that, that kind of creates you know, a use it's back to saying I can use a screwdriver for everything. And I'm like, no, no, you can't, you know, you can, it just doesn't work. And yeah. so, yeah, you're in that scenario. I'd be like, yeah, that's perfect. There's nothing wrong with what you're doing there. Yeah. Okay. Well, it's good to know not to overdo it though. Still. Yeah. Mostly, but it, it becomes that model of, I guess it's five minutes. Good. 10 minutes would be better. Yeah. Would 10 minutes good. Would 20 minutes be better. You know, I literally had a client therapy client years ago, that came in and she would foam roll for an hour before exercise. Now it didn't start with, an, it didn't start at an hour. You know what I mean? It started with five minutes and then five minutes became 10 minutes, 10 minutes became 20 minutes and 20. This is before she works out. And then, it, then it became, Oh, I don't feel good if, unless I do it for half an hour, then, Oh, you know, it takes about 40 minutes for me to get through. But if I don't do it, I don't feel good. And so it kind of became this, it's like nobody starts at 24 aspirin. Yeah. you know it's like one aspirin's good no it's not enough two aspirin's better oh and then eventually yeah i'm taking 24 aspirin i don't know what happened you know so yeah no your use is fine i wouldn't have any issue with that that's again the athlete has already figured it out they've already been working through a process yeah mm -hmm. cool awesome. um okay so we got a bunch of questions here i don't know if you guys have any other ones um before we get into all of these kurt i know you had a question no that was not my someone sent me that one that i sent you yep so let's start with that one <clears throat> training shoulders and biceps on the same day would would you would you say that that's a good idea eric training shoulders and biceps on the same day what's what's our goal the goal is always for us it's uh to be as big as possible and yeah. as shred as possible at the same time so I think shoulders and, and biceps actually aren't a bad idea, to be honest. I think uh, a lot of people that want to divide up body parts, um, you know, don't realize how often they train shoulders, mm -hmm. right? It's like, hey, I did chest day. Okay. And then I did an arm day. Yeah. Okay. And then I did a back day. Now I'm going to do shoulders. Like you, you did shoulders four days in a row. 
you know, right? You can't tell me that you didn't use your shoulders. And so we might have a reference of like, hey, more more press dominant, more swing dominant. One of the things I do see is a lot of challenge. Um, a lot of guys have bicep development issues and they, they kind of don't understand that their anterior delt and their long head of their bicep are kind of lined up really close on top of each other. And so if you're thinking I'm going to do bicep work and my long head, which is a big, huge deal. Um, but my, I'm not, I don't want to get my shoulders in this. And I'm like, I, wow, I don't, I don't know how you're not getting that in there. Does that make sense? Right. I might bias biceps away from, you know, side laterals or rear delt type stuff, but I, I certainly wouldn't think that I'm trying to get anterior delt, even pressing type movements to get out of on my bicep work. So I, I wouldn't have a problem with either of that. Awesome. Um, do you, do you like when people use a log book to measure your progress on lifts? <laughs> yeah, I was going to ask about progressive overload actually. Yeah. In terms of what? Well, just like your, your thoughts on that, like approach in general, because obviously it's like, it is a popular way to train in bodybuilding in terms of like, you know, every week trying to get a little bit stronger or get another rep on like your compound movements, especially. Sure. So I mean, we can all see where that can go wrong, but I just want your take on it, I guess. Yeah, so I'm probably the guy that that destroys the logbooks more than anything else, to be honest. Um, yeah. Now, having said that, like, not everybody pays attention to their progress the same way, right? And so if you take it out of context and say logbooks don't, don't matter at all, I'd be like, well, okay, there's some, you got to have some kind of tracking of something. Um, what happens a lot though, is when you get really advanced lifters, you know, as we get older or guys that have been lifting for 10 years, you know, 15 years, I mean, are you really looking at PRs every workout? Like, you know, it's pretty hard to, you know, if you're a brand new guy, you're gonna be like, wow, every week <laughs> I'm doing something different. This is, you know, just put five more pounds on that bar. I'm just, and at the beginning, your, your progress is you know, like, wow. And a lot of that is skill and some neurological development, but you're thinking I'm going to be lifting a thousand pounds, you know, like in no time. Right. And then eventually we get this, like, Oh, the skill is done. The neurological adaptation is done. Now we get into like, we have to start earning, earning some muscle and it gets harder and harder to keep thinking, Oh, you know, what's five more pounds of muscle, not five more pounds on the bar, but five more pounds of muscle. Mm. And so I think when you take it out of context, the both ends of that can get crazy. You don't track anything. Now what are we doing? Right? Oh, we should track everything. And all we pay attention is the numbers. Oh, wait a minute. What the hell? That we got lost. And so I think there's sort of some answer somewhere, unfortunately, in the middle and will dictate from some athletes. They want to stare at their numbers. It's kind of like, that's it. And then some guys don't care. Now, I've had conversations with world-class bodybuilders where I've said, listen, if you could look like you look standing on stage at the Olympia and you could, I'm theoretical, this is hypothetical, right? And just lift five pounds. Would you be interested in doing that? And I've had lots of bodybuilders go, yeah, man, if you can help me look like this and just lift five pounds, you know, like I'm interested in that. And then I've had a group of people that said, nope, I'm not interested in that at all. Mm. And I have no judgment either way. The guys that want to see a logbook and the guys that, that want to, you know, like well, I want to lift 500 pounds. I'm like, great, man. No problem. I just know who I'm talking to now. Yeah. I don't have a favoritism. I tend, if they had to say me personally, I tend to slide away myself away from logbooks because I can make so many changes to things that the, 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 the I'm changing the recipe so much that the, the exercise can be exponentially harder in so many different ways without me worrying about, oh, there's a number on the bar, you know, or there's a rep number. I'm usually thinking, you know, you've got to try and make it hard enough to make yourself fail in that eight to 12 range kind of thing. And most of that is, you know, are you squeezing hard enough? Are you actually moving slow enough to really feel like there's a failure in that eight range? A lot of guys play with the idea of five reps, you know, like, you should be gutting out five reps is the only thing that that um, five reps at failure kind of thing or five reps with one in reserve. I'm I'm cool with that, but that's a very experienced lifter, right? That's a very experienced lifter, and and that's not as satisfying for a lot of guys. 
right? If you keep yeah. them down in threes and fives, most bodybuilders are like, oh, I think I got to, I need some more volume. I need some more volume. It's not, not to interrupt you. It's not, they're not, you might be misquoting it. It's five effective reps. So it's yes. a set of 12. Sure. It's the last five. And you can generally tell when those occur because the tempo slows down on its own. I Absolutely. would never purposely, I would never, outside of bad form, I would never slow tempo down because when you do that, your nervous system won't recruit high threshold motor units. It's like, sure. like what Frank Zane used to do when he'd purposely make a weight feel heavier by going slowly. That's really mm -hmm. dumb. It's just recruiting type one fibers. <laughs> yeah. Now what I might do um, to play with some, some more health things versus the only reason we lift is to get bigger, which on this podcast is true, but there might be some rotate the tires thing going on with changing paces that I think if I can introduce a skill change, totally. Yeah, then all of a sudden the reps got really hard and now we're into a failure again. And so sometimes, you know, rep, pace type stuff versus i mean you can kill people with ridiculously slow reps like okay yeah. we're doing a minute of one rep and i'm like totally. I i'm sure most people are not gonna have fun or experience that that's no and that's not necessarily failure that's lactate building up yeah or that's just ions or something else build up and, and now yeah. for some people that might be one workout out of 20 that you just kind of go you know what we're just going to blow that system up or we're going to just challenge you a different way. Um, or I have to rotate the tires for some tendon health and I want some higher rep things. Totally. So I'm like, okay, there's a couple of different strategies, but again, those are things decided on the fly versus, Oh, my workbook says um, this is the third Monday. I should do a high rep something. And the, and the athlete is like, well, no, I've recovered. I'm good. I have nothing sore. Yeah. I'm like, wait, but the workbook says we need a download. And, and I'm like, uh, this is where I'm more saying if the athlete has been pushing performance so much, I'm kind of watching as a coach to be like, you know what? This is not the one we're going to, we're not going to die on this one today. I'm going to give you some more higher rep things and you're just going to feel some blood flow. And I'm happy to you know, say that, wow. Yeah. He needed, a, uh, he still needed the workout, but I can give him just a, a, a a different experience right and so yes five effective reps that becomes one of those same questions of what's the effective rep and and defined by that sort of i can't speed up right that kind of challenge is is uh um again really experienced lifter you know imagine the guys that are really don't know what they're trying to do and they say well all i care about is lifting to get to that <laughs> they're not an experienced lifter they're just want to bodybuild and they don't really know what a bench press is. They don't really know what a squat is. And you're like, you should be chasing, you know, those five exhausting reps, yeah. you know, and they have no nothing to bear, you know, to measure that again. Totally. I was going to, I was going to say something similar. I think that's the problem is now everyone's debating this. Is it failure? Is it a rep in reserve? Is it three reps in reserve? Is it, and I think the problem is I've been lifting for 36 years now. Yeah. Right. Yeah. I, I, I've lifted longer than most guys watching this have been alive. I can't tell you. <laughs> how many reps are in reserve. I know when I hit failure because it's task failure, it no longer completes a rep properly without me making yep. the form really bad or adjusting something. I only know how to train to failure and I can't communicate to someone do one rep in reserve. Yeah. What the F does that mean? So yeah. how do you expect someone new in the gym to then you say, well, do 15 reps, but leave three reps in reserve. Cause when you do that, especially with women, when you tell them that, and then you're like, well, you can do more. They'll do 15 more reps. You're like, well, that wasn't three reps in reserve. Right. Yeah. I think humans hold back, especially when they're new, because it hurts. So they yeah. don't push it hard enough. Anyway, I, I as a general rule, I would say most people should just push harder. Yeah. Be, yeah. Like everyone gets so caught in the weeds with all this training stuff. And I think it's okay for us to discuss this stuff. But I think when we talk about someone who's been in a gym for a year or two, they just need to train harder and eat better. Yeah. Yeah. Right. They, they need, they need folks on recovery to your tools. Growth, right? <clears throat> yeah. Recovery tools and challenge themselves. Right. Like that's, yeah. so most of the skill things that I see are just like, you haven't even exhausted the challenge stuff yet. Right. To be, to, you don't even know the depth of, of what a challenging set feels like. Now, again, that can somehow turn into what Mo was talking about before a trainer dragging you through the mud. Mm -hmm. to yeah, you. Totally. And I'm like, Oh, okay. That's irresponsible in the other way. But, but ultimately when you say, wow, my job as a coach is to, is to get somebody really experience something like to the depth of, of that movement or that, and, and kind of say, wow, okay. I am now understand what a quality rep is. Whoa. I feel it exactly where I'm supposed to feel. And I'm struggling, you know, kind of bouncing in and out of that perfect rep 
you know, high quality rep, but I'm now understanding where I should be aiming. I now I know what I should be aiming for. And that's really where, where once they start doing that, now numbers start making sense, right? I just think we start getting attached, as you said, to the numbers before we've done any quality control. And that seems like a, like a backwards scenario for me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. A lot of people tend to get caught in the, you know, is it, is it perfect technique or is it high intensity and, you know, which camp do I have to be in? Do I have to make sure every rep is perfect, but then I don't want to go too heavy because I want to be perfect or should I go high intensity and I don't have to worry about the form. A lot of, a lot of younger guys, especially feel like they have to pick one or the other, but I feel like what you guys are saying is that you just have to merge the two. You have to train hard that you always have to train hard. There's, there's never a time where you don't train hard. That's obvious, but then you just have to work on your skill and that comes with time. So you have to train your hardest, which you will train harder over time as you get stronger. And so when you're, you know, when you're young and you're only, you know, moving hundred pounds versus when you're, you know, me and Mo, now we're moving 600 pounds. That's a way different intensity. Okay. So you can't expect to have that intensity when you're just starting out that scales and then perfect technique that scales. And it depends on, again, the goal and what we're trying to do here. And, you know, perfect is relative because I don't think there's ever, would you say there's a, a perfect technique, Eric, or, you know, there's, there's optimal, but is there like perfect, you know? Well, so I've, I've tested this with a couple of athletes over the years. I mean, I've been in this business for a long time and, and every once in a while, like when you see a beautiful bodybuilder, you're like, Oh, that guy gets, and I say, how many, how many perfect reps, especially for regular people, how many perfect reps do you think they get? Right. If you ask a, a, a quality a body, you guys are three big guys. You got, you've been training for a long time. You have a lot of experience. Out of 10 reps, how many perfect reps do you think you get? <laughs> we try to make it all 10. I, okay, but I'm asking reality. Probably like eight. Eight, eight to nine. Yeah. Yeah. I, would I wouldn't stop it. Personally, I wouldn't stop at 10 if they were all perfect because that means that I didn't. Right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. And this See, is the warm up set. Well, so let's like, say, you know, it's my warm up set. I'll stop. No, no, I'm talking about working set. Your working set, how many perfect reps, you know, because I know you're be now, one shy what of, I might say, one shy of th finishing. Yeah. Now the funny part is that's our goal, right? But what if I said that, that the reps that are less than perfect, we're at like 95% perfect. You've gone, you've gone, you're, you don't need to work there. You're right. That's where injury occurs, right? Because yeah. you can't work more than a hundred percent. Once you've now uh -huh. gone once like in a leg extension, when you let, when you can no longer get to parallel, right? I'm using leg right. extension because it's an obvious one. When right. you can no longer get your legs to parallel, that's failure. Even if it's like this, that's technically failure. It means the muscle's not contracting fully anymore. Sure. If you then continue to then arch your back and you keep pushing out half reps, you're not working. It's not necessarily better. Now you're just doing partials. It's a whole sure, different. sure. So, so let me rephrase this. So, have you guys ever gone bowling? Have you ever bowled a strike? Mm -hmm. yeah. So you bowled a perfect game then? Oh yeah. No. 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 Well, one strike. One strike. Is a perfect so game. just so just so just do it again. So all you need is 12 perfect balls, right? That's it, <laughs> right? Perfect game. So at the end of the day, it's it's not to say that they're, because uh, we're talking about quality control, whatever. But I'm talking about the literally the possibility that your nervous system can line this up perfectly again. Because what looks like on the outside is those are the same. But what's happening on the inside is a rapid amount of, of corrections and a bunch of like fatigue profile things that the nervous system is literally just trying to say how... How can I sort of get it really close? And, and as it gets tired, it's trying to find these little places, stuff that, that we're doing to correct as high level athletes. Right. And so a lot of times that idea, if I can't do a perfect rep, I can't do it. And I'm like, well, I'm talking about these are very, very, very similar, but neurologically, they're just so slightly different. And so that sense that that these are as close as I can get. And I'm going to say eight out of nine or nine out of ten. I'd be like, wow, you are doing fantastic. Right. A le lesser lifter, you're looking at one really good rep and the rest of them sort of look like they're trying to figure it out, right? On the outside, it doesn't look so terrible, but they're internally, they're trying to be like, where can I find a path through this? Where can I find a, a way to, to kind of control this? I sped that one up. I slowed that one down a little too much. You know, I'm using a little of inertia, right? It takes a lot of skill to be kind of in this replication phase of, Yes, here's the count I'm staying on. Here's where my breathing is. Here's where my control is. I actually stop and transition and start again. Every rep was the same length, right? Like those are very, very high level skill things that you have to spend time learning. And so I don't know about, again, the, the idea of, of 
I'm really seeing a high level athlete that, that decides, yeah, I've got a lot of experience here. I know exactly what we're doing and I have skill. Yeah. Now you're seeing reps that start looking very, very, very close. And now we'd be like, yeah, okay. Now I can count numbers. Now I can count reps. Now I can count time. You know, if that makes any sense. Yeah, for sure. Makes a lot of sense. That's kind of, do you think that's so, you know, with the MI 40 thing, that's kind of where that came from is we're trying to get as much time under tension. That would be like a perfect rep. If we have optimal time under tension or a perfect set. Well, can I not to interrupt? Yeah. There's technically no such thing as time under tension. That's a man-made theory. Muscles don't experience time. There is mechanical yeah. tension. Mechanical tension is based on a mechano growth sensor. That is not, it does not experience an actual time. It's either on or off. It's experience or it's not. It has nothing yeah. to do with the amount of time that it's under load. The, the yeah. five rep thing is just because that in theory should be the perfect amount of tension experience yeah. to cause IGF to turn into mechanical growth factor. That's what's actually occurring. Yeah. It, the whole time under tension was to teach people to basically feel a rep or to not use bad form, but there's no such thing as time under tension. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's just like a summation, right? It's an internal yeah, summation. It's an easy of, way to, of, yeah. yeah, it's an internal summation of, of of polarizing, like binding and unbinding going on, right? And so obviously, yeah, to probably the time under tension as a man-made thing is the uh, teaching the inertial effects to control inertial effects, to fully be stopped and stop, you know, to kind of stop and start versus bouncing through reps and having like passive passive range of motion you didn't really earn like a bunch of those control things are really what time under tension techniques are kind of geared around so i totally agree yeah it's just a technique to teach people to get a result right but it's not in a real in reality it's not a real thing yeah it's, somebody does 10 with, reps in 10 seconds with no control totally. and somebody does 10 it's reps junk. in 20 seconds they're like oh okay, one of those did more work because yeah. they had to and control something. And one of the things you want to see, there's the gene called Titan that's inside of muscles. And when a muscle gets a fully lengthened and fully contracted, Titan straightens out and then contracts. That's one of the signaling processes for mechanical growth factor. That's also why doing partials, like I know this is like a popular thing right now too, which is ridiculous as well. The partial thing, you're not, Titan is not going to straighten fully out. So you're not going to get a full response, right? A muscle's made to fully lengthen and fully contract is how it's supposed to work. Mm -hmm. where, where I think the ridiculousness not to go on a full tangent, where I think the ridiculousness nowadays comes from the training thing is I think we need as a bodybuilding community to start separating naturals from enhanced lifters. I think a lot of these training nuances that we can discuss are much more valid for natural lifters or professional athletes. I think when you're talking about bodybuilders and I'll be the first one to admit, it doesn't really matter what I do in the gym. I'm enhanced. I hate to say that I eat enough food. I take enough gear. I lift hard and I go home and I get enough sleep. I will grow. If you can't grow in that scenario, you're something's wrong or you have a genetic issue. It's when you talk about training natural people, those little nuances matter much more. That's why you'll see pro bodybuilders do all sorts of craziness, right? You can watch Sam Sulik lift. Doesn't mean he knows what he's doing, right? Yeah. <laughs> On three grams of gear, eats donuts pre-workout and he's got good genetics. What does it matter? Who cares what he's doing? It's like copying any of these guys like Ronnie Coleman, Jay Cutler. It doesn't matter. Find a pro athlete who's natural, see what they're doing. That's going to be much more impressive, right? Mm -hmm. Like you work, the guys you work with, probably their training matters much more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Because if you if you if you're drug tested and whatever, then for sure you got you got to yeah. make sure. And I've worked with football players too. Not all of them are natural either, but you know, they still yeah. The nuances that you guys deal with are a lot different than what a body. Yeah, player. yeah. We like sure. to pretend yeah. that what we do matters more than it does. Yeah. And I think that, I think the, uh, it's funny because we start talking about the length and loaded positions then. Right. So if it can I ask you then from your end, so if somebody is doing a, a, a fully lengthened position, but they cannot finish the rep, that is the full shortening they can get. Um, it's essentially it's, it's maximal ability load is done, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but they got to the full length and position loaded and they, and then that's already, that's just that, that load is complete. In theory, and not all muscles grow from a fully lengthened position, right? Like biceps don't, triceps mm -hmm. technically don't either. So like stretching them fully does not, they don't respond to stretch mediated hypertrophy. Some muscles do, quads do, right? right? right. Lats don't either because there's a certain point in your lats where now it becomes chest, right? If you watch a pull-up, the very mm -hmm. top of it's actually your chest that's pulling, not the back. Sure. You know, so it's not every muscle. I think that's the other thing is that th what you and I look at, even though we're coming from different angles, is so is so specialized and takes so long to understand that it doesn't translate to the average person. So then they start guessing at things. Right. Or they take right. a theory that's very complicated 
and they try to apply it across the board. Yeah, they make a, a right. standard law. Yeah, and the problem is you can't, right? And you know that, and I know that. Like, there is no, I I don't like to speak in absolutes because there are very few absolutes in life. Yeah, yeah, that's the funny one when they're saying, is this good or bad? And I'm like, oh, oh, I don't have enough information no. to, to yeah. tell you, you know. Yeah, right. and I didn't mean before that it doesn't matter what bodybuilders do. I just mean, I, no, I no. would say of all of the variables when it comes to bodybuilders, and I'm just being honest, I would say genetics is number one, right? If you're going to win the Olympia, you have the best genetics in the world. I think number two is probably your diet. And then a, way far down below that is probably your drug use, what you can tolerate, how you respond. And then your training, honestly, is probably four. I hate mm. to say that. That's just kind of what I see. And to quote Justin Harris, bodybuilding is a game of eating chicken and rice. Whoever can eat the most chicken and rice without getting fat is going to be the best bodybuilder in the world. Yeah. It's so such I, a game I, of who I, can I, lift the most weight. That's weightlifting. Yeah. Right? It's, it's not funny, a training I, game. It's an eating game. I ended up, uh, I was goals gym in Toronto way back when, when it first started, I was a member there and I'm like 17 years old kid, you know, 16, 17 years old in the gym. And I'm looking at a world-class, you know, this full of like the who's who Henderson was there. I remember, um, uh, in his day, right. You know, just a brick. <laughs> and I remember looking at this one white guy and I said, wow, you look amazing. And said, what'd you do? And then he listed up all these different things he had to do like this, the food change and this change and that change and, and uh, change my training and this, and that this is the cardio I'm doing. He literally listed off, you know, 50 things that he's done to look this great. And then I see a black guy walk in and he's going to the same contest. And, and I asked this guy, I'm like, wow, what do you do? And he said, oh, I stopped having Kentucky fried chicken. Yeah, you know, well, look, Ronnie and, Coleman, same way. When, and I was just like, oh, bodybuilding is that. Like one guy has to be a monk. Another guy basically just, you know, cleans it up a little bit. And, zook, you know, regardless, I, I let's assume they're on the same amount of gear. And these two bodies just could respond completely different. And he say, wow, like just, wow. You know, like, yeah, they can kind of, you're going to see rule breakers in all these other people. And I think it's funny when the bodybuilding community is kind of saying, Oh, whatever Ronnie Coleman did, I should do that. No. I'm like, Ronnie and Coleman did sets to 50, you know, like with six well, plates on his back and stuff. Right. Like an interesting thing about Ronnie Coleman, the best, and I, I'm a coach as well. And so I, I find the best clients and Ronnie Coleman falls into this camp. The best bodybuilding clients are the ones that don't overthink anything. Ronnie yeah. Coleman was just happy to have his food and lift weights. He didn't give a shit. He followed orders exactly. Mm -hmm. And he, that's why he was so good, right? It's the it's the guys that question everything you say to them or mm -hmm. overthink everything or make adjustments. Like you give them a plan, they always are adjusting things. They're always one step ahead of you trying to fix something. Mm -hmm. Those are the ones that never succeed, right? Right. And that's because right. they're they're finicking along. And yeah. And, and you can give a thousand, I could give a thousand examples of genetically gifted bodybuilders that used way less drugs than you would think they didn't even know what they were taking i guarantee you half the time ronnie coleman had no idea what he was taking in whatever amount if you listen to those interviews where he talked about his cycles they made zero sense <laughs> he was just told to take x y and z in certain amounts right. and he just did it he doesn't know what he was doing right you know you even listen I, you, there was an interview with jay cutler once and he went off on how we never used tran and then five minutes later he was talking about using parabol and it was like it just shows you don't know what you're doing you were just taking what your coach told you Right, right. You know, I don't, right. I wouldn't, I would never copy the workout routines of these guys. I wouldn't copy the drug routines of these guys. None of it has any application to the average person. Well, yeah. When somebody, I mean, I see a lot of that. Like I have guys come up to me and go, oh, I'm, I'm doing C-bums uh, workout. And I'm like, <laughs> are you injecting well, oil in your shoulders too? Well, I'm, I'm just, I'm just matter? staring at him. Like, I don't really know how to comment that you're okay. He's a world-class athlete and He's got mobility that I know you don't have. And I'm like, I don't, I don't know what your expectation is, but there's sort of this copy and paste kind of idea that a bunch of people will do. And instead of, you know, Hey, we need to figure out what an individual has and figure out what the individual, where the individual wants to go. Right. It starts like, you know, it's kind of like that journey thing. You as a coach has to say, okay, where do you want to go? And then the second question is where, how do we figure out where you are? Yeah. <laughs> you know, right. How do we like, get there? And then, and then how many steps is going to take to get yes. there, you know, in, in what time frame do we have? And so a lot of them just say, well, I just don't want to be where I am. You know, I want to be that. And I'm like, 
okay, well, the, the, I don't even know where you're moving from to get to where you want to go. And they just put a picture on the wall and stare at it and think, I'm just going to do whatever he did. And, you know, he ate 20 chickens. I'm going to eat 20 chickens. He did bench press. I'm going to bench press. Yeah. You know? well, there's something <clears throat> called survivor. An interesting human phenomenon in psychology is there's something called survivorship bias mm. where we focus on the winners, right? We only look at those. So you look at the guys the top 10 guys that made it to the Arnold, right? You don't mm. see the other 100,000 guys that train in a gym, a million guys in a gym that have tried the same thing, that tore, tore a tendon, overdosed on something, had liver failure, you know what I mean? Couldn't tolerate more than a gram of gear, can't eat because they got, you know, a gut issue, you know, got acne, their hair fell out, all everything you can imagine is, but we don't ever look at that right? Which we should, you should probably focus more on what the average result is from these processes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah like, you're staring at like the You're looking at Arnold Schwarzenegger and you're like, look at the golden era guys. You were seeing 10 dudes out of a thousand guys at Gold's Gym. You don't yeah, never yeah, saw yeah. the other 900 guys that had liver failure. Yeah, you're seeing, you're like seeing like the guys standing on a, on a hill of bodies, you know? Right? Yeah, and you're literally and looking at the top. Just, just I'm grab the one on the top. That's all we have to worry about. Nobody sees yeah. anything, the iceberg under the water. Right? Yeah, how did they see? How did the top guys sports? I get in pro sports is like, you know, how many, I think is it 10 to a hundred thousand athletes produce this one, you know, and you go, Oh, it's not like a drill press where they sort of get popped out at the end. They just survived the process. And so what I see that survivor bias, it's like saying, um, I don't know, get one of our, our successful, the most successful NHL goalie you can think of in your head. And you say, yeah, his dad threw rocks at his head every day. Now, I guarantee everybody that says, I want my kid to make it to the NHL, that guy's so awesome. That sounds like that makes sense. And that guy could open a camp, sell rocks, and start throwing them at kids. And the kids that survived that are for sure going to become NHL goalies. And you kind of go, what, what, what? You know, the sad part is some of it sounds like way off the wall. But if you put so much focus in that, it's like, yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. That makes sense. You just start excluding the reality of, of, you know, wait, you, that guy doesn't even look like you, you know, like I've talked to bodybuilders in this more recent couple of years and said, okay, pick a guy that looks like you, like, regardless, pick a world-class bodybuilder that has kind of the same length of arms, the same upper length of arms, you know, find somebody that kind of resembles you, not somebody you go, I want to look like that guy. And I'm like, okay, well, you, 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 you know, you're white and you picked a black guy, like, okay, well, we'll start with that doesn't fit. Or you've got long femurs and he's got long tibias and you like, okay, your muscle bellies are completely different. Like, you know, start picking the parts, not just bolos are great. It's like, okay, I appreciate that looking at stuff and being a yeah. fan, but you got to start saying, you know, how do you make, how do you make an antelope a better antelope? Not how do you make an antelope a caribou? And you're like, exactly. These are, these, you know, that's not, I see a lot of bodybuilding kind of gets yeah. off the rails. I'm like, you, you didn't even start with the same uh, kind of platform. And you're, you're kind of thinking everybody's going to look like that guy if I just do his job. And I'm like, yeah. that guy is six foot three, 330 pounds. And you're five foot, you know, seven. Yeah. It's like me. <laughs> it's like me and Mo or me and, you know, any guys that are on this podcast. I'm short. I, when I was a child, the bodybuilder that I idolized was Danny Padilla. I don't even know oh, nice. what Danny Padilla is anymore because he has the same structure as me. So like yeah. to me, I could attain that. I never looked at Arnold be like, I could attain that. I'm five foot seven. I'm not going to be mm. six foot three. I would mm. never look like Arnold. But like you're saying, pick up yeah. these. Yeah, pick the guy that you could kind of resemble. I mean, I think it's interesting. You look you at can... C-Bomb or the guy that just won uh, at the Arnold, the Brazilian. Um, and then they put him next to Arnold, right? And they're, they're proportionally like some old Arnold picks and they literally the same pose and they kind of proportionally look similar, you know? And so you're kind of like, Oh, okay. Like, you know, to me, that makes more sense that you're saying this apple and this apple, look at these two apples, you know, but sometimes I'm like, that's a pineapple and that's a banana. Like, what are you trying to do here? You know? I think a lot of us inherently have that bias though. Like, you know, like for example, like when we were doing our Arnold predictions, you know, some of the shorter guys naturally just picked hottie. Some of the taller guys like me, like me and Mo and whoever we pick Samson, you know, not not thinking like he would win for sure, but just because that's where our bias is. Yeah. We we, we would generally go for that type of physique, right? So not not necessarily comparing ourselves to Samson because we we know we're different bodybuilders, but you know, inherently for myself, I would, you know, choose white guys, white bodybuilders that are around the same height, 
that looked similar to me, not saying I looked like Jay Cutler, but he was a guy, 5'11 or whatever, you know, white guy, obviously, similar-ish, you know. I mean, you know, not trying to compare myself to Jay Cutler, but that would be the goal, right? That would be the guy that I would want to look like because I know that would be what I could potentially look like if I realized that. But, you know, I think also uh, the mentality of guys too, like that's why I was so drawn to guys like Ben Pekulski or, you know, Branch Warren or just Dorian Yates. It's the guys that, you know, not necessarily thinking I'm going to look like that guy, but thinking if I could adopt or if I could obtain or if I could live like this, you know, what I perceive the mindset to be the ideal mindset, then I could be the best version of what I would look like. Mm-hmm. And I, and I, that's what kind of drew me to some of those other guys too. The the guys like Eric Fankhauser, for example, I don't know if you guys know Eric Fankhauser, but he's a guy from, you know, 2000s and he had the hardcore mentality and it was just, you know, not like I have to be the biggest or the most shredded. That's not really the goal. It's the fact that I'm going to be the one who lives this lifestyle the fullest in a way. So I don't know. I thought that was cool. It's like, Mm -hmm. you know, okay. But then it's, but then it's it's just a journey. um, Not just, then it's a journey of self-development. Right. And so bodybuilding is not, Oh, I want to look like that bodybuilder. Bodybuilding is like, I want to be the best me. Right. And so, you know, you are sort of saying, Hey, if I'm going to borrow this template idea of, you know, I want to do what Samson does. It's like, well, are you six foot three? Let's start with that. You know, are you, uh, do you have proportions similar to that? You know, and so this is where I start sort of saying, if somebody does want to replicate something is like, well, at least, you know, kind of aim in the same, in the same categories, you know, like, uh, you know, as simple as looking at, are you, a, you want to be a heavyweight, look at heavyweights, you know, you want to, <laughs> you want to be a, don't look at the, you know, they all have nice bodies. They all have nice bodies. You know, it goes back to where you want to, where do you want to go? Where are you now? Right. And it, and I want to go there. Okay. Then, then, then at least pick something that allows you to stuck and actually physically get there. Mm-hmm. Right. And I don't care if you actually do, but it's more like the whole, replication of whatever they do i will do and i'm like you're not even you know again it's like different animals trying to do different things i, I think with training it's something you really got to like kind of figure out yourself as you go and like and yeah like, you know it's so cliche to say but like you got to do what works for you but you do and, and it takes a long time like you got to hammer away at it consistently to find the movements that you you know you feel the best mind muscle connection with and, and you can develop the best skill with because that's ultimately what it is especially at our level mm-hmm. like like i do agree with kurt in that you know, what you said about, you know, genetics being the most important than diet and then drugs and then training to an extent, I agree. But I think at our level, when your genetics are what they are, you know, you're doing all the drugs you can do, your diet's perfect, you know, you're at a high level. I think that is where like at our level, trying to get better, like training is more important than ever. Like that's in yeah, my, I mind. know the problem yeah. with that statement is it's not, it, it's it the doesn't thing that we have control over there. Right. Like we don't have, yeah, and I didn't, genetics. I know I'm going to get heat over that. I yeah. just, I think yeah, people yeah, misunderstand well, yeah. the genetic thing, though, right? Because they, they understand it with basketball. You can clearly look that I'm never going to play basketball. I couldn't well, play well, a high school basketball team. Well, like, exactly. And that's what I'm saying. It's like the genetics have to be there for this to get to the point where this matters. Like, right? It's yeah. like, because like now my pursuit is to be the best at training that I can be. Like, I have all the other. Because you've exhausted the other oh, metrics. Exactly. Exactly. No, but I meant oh, more God. for like the kid that's coming up right who looks up to you who's you know yeah. half your size that he's so in the weeds with this thing you know am i following mike mentor's stuff am i doing uh you know yeah. am i training like jay cutler or am i at that point like just find your groove right yeah. just work hard at something and eat right and you'll yeah, grow totally, that's totally. What, that's what i meant by that i just meant like so many people get in the weeds about these like nuances that i'm not really sure matter especially once you're enhanced like yeah it, you know i i work with most of my guys are normal middle-aged dudes that are on some sort of trt or enhanced version of trt and so you know we're talking about average genetics ag- like minor minor gear usage so they're not like they're not like a bodybuilder and it's just mm. it's it's very interesting to see what what they focus on and stuff it's just it's very different right like the nuances that they get stuck in and a lot of times it's there it's usually comes down to food for most of those guys it's their diet is really screwy yeah. It's not a training thing generally, you know, yeah. it, it's like a double-edged sword. I go to a million different gyms. I rarely see people train hard ever, except when I go, like the Arnold to go to the, you know, went to this gym and it was all pros. They're all lifting their asses off. Everyone's working hard. 
that's rare. Like you go to a commercial gym, at least in America, no one works hard. Like mm-hmm. if I handed out a thousand dollars to someone, I actually saw busting their ass. I would go home with that thousand dollars every day. There's like some person walking on a freaking treadmill and there's someone. See, that's what I mean. I, 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 extensions. I, I, that's why I personally, I agree with Mo in, in if I had to rank things, yes, genetics is first, you know, but that's, you don't have control over that diet. Sure. You could put that next, but let's just say that's always a hundred percent. Then, you know, gear is at the bottom. I put mm-hmm. training before gear because even if it's a natty guy or not, I mean, that's one thing you have control over and you can, you can put in the effort and it's cause it's, it's all the time too. It's every day and it's a cumulative thing. Right. So as a natural athlete, who, who wins the show? It's the guy that worked harder. It's the guy that worked harder on the cardio too, but it's the exact same thing. Also, we see this in the IFBB too. If, if you're looking at the guys that are doing three hours of cardio, they're usually the guys that are winning because they're in shape. I'm not saying you have to do three hours of cardio, but the guys that are in shape, they usually win unless they're just well, not big enough. Yeah. We'll but, you know, I think that's, and Samson. yeah. And I think that's where if everybody's training their hardest, it's like now there's, well, look at, look at Hottie training. What he does is hard, but it doesn't look like it's hard because he does it all the time and he's good at it. Now he's got that skill acquisition where he can just like, he knows he can go like all out and do that. That's, that's why he wins. In my opinion, I think that's why he wins because everything else is pretty much a given but that's the one thing that he can do and it's a mindset thing too because we see guys not even for myself I have good days and bad days but every bad day is a day where I'm not I'm not giving 100% even if I think I am I'm trying to the more you know the more you can hone in on that mindset that's where like I would put mindset first but regardless the training thing is that's a mindset trickling into a Nick Walker mentality, a hottie mentality. Like I'm going in there. I know I'm giving hundred percent because I know I'm becoming Mr. Olympian. And it's just, it's a different thing versus, yeah, you know, uh, it takes discipline too, though, to understand like when you're doing something for so long that gets you so far to be like, this is not working anymore. Like I think that separates guys too, because you can be, you can get to being a really good pro bodybuilder with your training, not being that great, just going in hammering it like bro split, whatever. But then to, to, like you know drop your ego and have the discipline to be like okay i need to start paying attention to like these more details and like patterns of movement and things like that like that's mm. that's really tough for a guy who's been bodybuilding for like 10 or 12 years yeah you know? well, so I, I'm, I'm not going to rip on it i'm not i'm not going to say any names but i'll give you an example that happened here on this show a couple weeks ago and it's a good example of a, a pro bodybuilder who's probably got better genetics than average right he's clearly using gear and he eats a lot of food and the training thing was relatively insignificant because we proposed the question, what do you do to bring up a lagging body part? And this gentleman's answer was do more of it. Do more of what? The wrong thing. <laughs> yeah. And his yeah. answer was, yeah, his answer was yes. Mm. And yeah, that so, happened on so, this show. I'm not going to tell you who it is, but he's a pro. And so my answer is, so it just shows that the training variable might not be as important as people think. Cause if, if you have pros that are, telling you that if your back needs to grow and you're doing the wrong things, if you just do more of those things, your back will get bigger. Right. And so yeah. I, I, I agree sort of, I think we're, we're, you're almost talking about a couple of different versions of this, but yeah. like there's guys, if you see a beautiful bodybuilder, that's big dude and all the other stuff. And I can see this context. And, and I know somebody I'm thinking about right now that um, if you look at him, he, he pretty much doesn't, if I'm going to pick on somebody, he's pretty much doing all kinds of things wrong. And he looks fantastic, <laughs> right? Yeah. And the only thing that's different, and I'm knock on wood now, is that one day he tears or something. One day, you know, and we've seen, I mean, I've been around longer than you guys. I've You'd see the muscle mags and you see these up and coming bodybuilders and some of these guys would just come out of nowhere and just be unbelievable. And then all of a sudden they're gone. They just don't exist anymore. And you're like, whatever happened to that guy? And he, like, he was, you know, wow, he was getting all this press and he was showing up in pictures and all of a sudden he's gone. Oh, he tore his pec right off or he ripped his bicep open or he, he blew out his knee or whatever. His kneecap flew off, you know, <laughs> it was all these sort of traumatic injuries that could not be recovered from. And so I think for sure their genetics, for sure they were eating right, for sure they're in the scene, they're training hard, they're pushing themselves but their technique is like looking at Tom's plats and whatever and going, Oh, he <laughs> bangs around. So I'm just going to do that. And they can survive it until all of a sudden they can't. And then all of a sudden now that's the dividing line is that 
some guys can withstand injuries till they can't, you know, and then you go, Oh, bad luck. And I'm like, wait a minute. So that would be, he still got the results. There's nothing wrong with what I'm doing. If I've got these results, my shoulders look like this. You can't tell me I'm doing it wrong. And so then it's like, wait a minute, but do you have elbow pain? Do you have wrist pain? You know, do, do you feel your neck all the time? You know, I can't turn my head to one side, but you look amazing. And so I would be like, Oh, there's a story going on under, underneath the hood that nobody's really paying attention to. And their mechanical system is starting to feel the wear and tear. And they just sort of manage to handle it. Like pro athletes are all hurt. The word injured doesn't exist for pro football players, right? That means they can't play. And so I remember seeing guys that I've worked with that like can't lift their arm over their head for two years and made the pro bowl. And I'm looking at him like, that's not an injury for you. And I know he's torn his bicep. I can see like a torn this and a torn that. I can see surgery scars. And he, I said, any injuries need to know? But he says, no, none. <laughs> I, and I'm like, oh, okay, well, what do you want me to work on? Well, I can't raise my arm above, you know, my shoulder height. And I said, okay, how long has that been? And then he gives me a date that's two seasons ago. And they made the Pro Bowl last year. And I'm, I said, you, you made the Pro Bowl last year? Yes, sir, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Yeah. I said, you haven't been able to lift your arm above your shoulder height for two years and you're you're voted one of the best players in the nfl yeah yes sir thank you yeah <laughs> so i'm like how is that not injured and he's like well because he can play through it mm -hmm. he obviously can play at a very high level so people can tolerate right and maybe gear is helping you tolerate that maybe the genetics is helping you tolerate maybe that the muscle bellies are timing pro athletes can handle stuff that regular people just cannot handle and so their tolerance of less than perfect reps less than you know, perfect sets, more volume, right? They, you can almost kind of do anything to some of these pro athletes and they respond. And, and then it just becomes maybe the line of, man, this isn't working when most saying is more like I got elbow pain that just kind of doesn't go away. And it's on one side. Maybe that's not so cool. Maybe this is now I'm seeing like a limit of what I can handle. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, look at um, what's his name that, that tore his long head of his tricep you know doing uh pullovers right mm -hmm. it's like, oh he's big dude right one of the guys our gym you know tore his tricep oh, doing God, um, right 150 yeah. pound pullovers <laughs> <laughs> that's you know well that's what you're saying is it it works until it doesn't yeah you know now the funny part is i can do 120 pound pullovers i don't look like him right so is it the number or is it the now 150 is a big jump from 120 yeah. i'll tell you that so but but, you know, it, it, it's, is it the number on the thing or is he just borrowing whatever he can to put 30 more pounds on that until his tricep finally says, all right, I'm done. I can't, you can't go through that joint that way without tearing off, right? Now, chances are that wasn't one rep. That was just one rep too many. You know, he'd sort of been going to the hole longer. And if I can move more load and I got big, huge arms, then that's what I'm going to do. And then all of a sudden, well, went to the bank too many times. There's nothing left in the bank tear, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and maybe, you know, again, the endocrine guy is going to say, man, there's, there's lots of ability to help recovery, right? That turns into I can handle recovery till I finally, yeah, tendons aren't able to respond that way, you know? Yeah. Right. So you've got all this big, this soup of superhuman body with really great design, adapts well to exercise, right? Some people do 10 reps of something and some people do 10 reps and one guy gets bigger and one guy doesn't. And you're like, is it the technique? And it, is it his amount of testosterone? Is it sleep, stress, all those things? And you kind of go, yeah, all of it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Some guys even, just walk even to if, the gym. Yeah. Even if his technique is perfect. Now you're adding, you know, X amount of weeks out, one, two weeks out from a show, you know, you know, probably obviously super depleted by that point, stressed out by that point. You know, mm -hmm. Ramadan, you know, you're having a weird sleep schedule, eating schedule, all these things add up to a thing that, you know, you could do that on a normal day, but that's where, that's where we have to decide, okay, now are we, are we scaling down on volume? Are we scaling down on the intensity going into a show? I, you know, I, I believe when we talked about this a little bit, Eric, and also kind of what you're saying here occurred a little bit too, is this is what I believe is that if you were to say that training was the least important, it'd be the least important going through that contest prep phase, because in the off season, you need to have that training there in order to create the stimulus in order to actually get any growth. But on your contest prep, you're doing everything else to get in shape. So you're really just holding on to the mm -hmm. muscle. So if you're trying to go in there with that, you know, animal kill everything instinct, you know, when you're one, two weeks out, that's where the injury is going to happen. You know, mm -hmm. I've gone through that 
tons and tons of pro bodybuilders have gone through that because we don't know how to start scaling down when it's time to focus more on rest and recovery. Again, remember, we were talking about this, Eric, you know, like one, two weeks out from New York and the, one of the uh, conversations you're having with Ben about taking like three days off uh, before competition. It's like, that's crazy. That's crazy talk. What do you mean take three days off before a competition? I need to train. I got to do all this stuff. But if you actually do that, you end up looking better. So what's the purpose of the bodybuilding show is to look our best. So what is the training doing at that point? It's not making us look any better at that point. So I think that's when it becomes the least important, you know, but it scales, mm. right? It's it's very important in the off season because otherwise what's all that food going to do? Turn to fat unless you're creating the right <laughs> stimulus. So, but then, you know, one week out, it's like, dude, <laughs> well, I was, I was injured and depleted and doing like one plate on the bench press. But then I get on stage and I looked fucking awesome. So, you know, what's yeah, more important yeah. again, right? Bodybuilding versus like you're saying, weightlifting, powerlifting, you know? Mm -hmm. um, okay, no, this is good. So I want to go back just a little bit there. So talking about the back sessions, a lot, of, a lot of people are trying to bring up, you know, whether it's legs or back, but just focusing on the back. How would you set up a back workout? If I wanted to train my back twice a week, we want to have one where we're focusing on traps, say one where we're focusing on lats or whatever, however you want to put mm -hmm. it together. Uh, how would you put those workouts together, Eric? Yeah, I think uh, some of the stuff that that uh, we've had these long conversations about, about sort of missing parts. I get a lot of questions, you know, hey, can you help me develop this sort of lower, mid, lower trap, you know, sort of hole in my back. And a lower lot of guys, if they have trap, a lot of, yeah. If they have a lot of upper trap, they think, oh, I don't need to train traps. And I'm like, well, no, you, you actually probably have a dysfunctional set of shoulders. Um, so something like serratus work, as an example, is is pretty important thing relative to just actually having your shoulders move properly. So I might prioritize it. Uh, I might say you don't have to make a, a – most of the guys that are doing pullover type stuff, things, they're sort of throwing it in at the end. I would throw it in at the start. To be honest, more often, you don't need to make it a whole workout, but I'd probably put two or three sets in just to feel like, wow, I've got I've got more and more mobility. Um, those those serratus muscles are going to fit my 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 scapula properly to my rib cage. Right. And now I can actually start to feel most of these exercises. So I would say, you know, again more like rotate the tires a little bit. Does that make sense? I would really be saying if you have one that's trap dominant sort of rear delt, you know, lat type stuff. And then you have sort of some, again, I, I think a lot of people don't train hips enough relative and lower back relative to back development. Um, they don't realize your, your, the whole trunk, uh, thoracolumbar fascia kind of engaging of your trunk is very hip related, right? We need hips and abs to actually help us use lats. And so when people aren't really kind of thinking, oh, I'm going to do any back stuff, you know, lower back stuff. It's happening at the end after. And I'm like, you'd be shocked if you fill up your back, your spinal erectors, how much lat actually starts to engage, you know, but because people are sort of programmed of uh, more the bias of where can I move the most load, then they just kind of shift everything in that direction, you know, which is very power lifter, uh, Olympic lifter kind of um, format, right? You just do the big lifts and then everything else becomes assisting lifts. I would say most often you're trying to find a way to get more stress on the system, right? You need more mind muscle connection. You need an ability to actually feel what you're actually trying to contract and you need your serratus and, and uh, ab and trunk muscles to do a lot more than you realize. And so sometimes just doing sets to, to pump that up is not going to do much to, to hurt your, your actual poundage output, but you're going to start to feel, wow, okay, I can really feel my bent over rows now because I have some back muscles actually working. Does mm -hmm. that make more sense? Yeah, for sure. So talking about, yeah, rotating the tires. So if we're going to be doing different back workouts, we're not just going to be doing heavy rows twice. We're not just going to be doing like, you know, the same movements over and over again. We're going to be switching out different movements. So even if it is uh, a pullover movement, we can switch out do lat pullovers with the dumbbell lat pullovers with the machine cable mm -hmm. all sorts of stuff but we're getting in different um like just patterns of movement right so we're training our lats through different ranges we're acquiring different ranges of motion with our shoulder a lot of yeah. the stuff that, that you have me do eric i really like because i can go through multiple different back workouts without kind of repeating the same thing like i could do like four or five six different back workouts with similar exercise mm -hmm. routines but in different orders uh different techniques 
um, supersets. I mean, there's there's so many different ways to put together back workouts, but I think people just get caught up with, okay, if I want to train my lats, I got to do like really heavy pull downs, something like this. Mm -hmm. Or, mm -hmm. you know, if I want to get big traps, I got to do deadlifts and I got to do, you know, bent over rows. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. a lot of the things that you've been having me do to improve my traps, like you said, the dumbbell pullovers, doing a lot more shrugging movements. Cause I think a lot of guys just don't even bother with shrugs for some reason. It's like, again, probably because what you're saying about the upper traps, I already have upper traps. So I don't need to do more shrugs, but incorporate. Yeah. So it, if you think of like upward rotation of your scapula, right. And, and everybody would say, Oh, upper trap that your entire trap is actually involved in upward rotation. Mm -hmm. So your lower, when people are thinking, Oh, I've got to do Y raises for lower trap. And I'm like, no, you just have to do an upward rotation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And so if you're thinking the cables coming from farther out, a dumbbell doesn't do this. It just doesn't fit great at the glenoid, mm -hmm. but you're trying to pull from out to in. That is a diamond shaped thing. But when the scapula starts to come up, guess what's happening? The spine of the scapula is going down. Well, it's like, what's helping is lower trap, middle trap and upper trap to help pull you there. So it's kind of this weird thing that I need lower traps. So I need to do overhead movements. I'm like, mm -hmm. No, like you don't have to play, you know, play with really heavy, weird upper body movements. Like something like that Y raise is fine. Don't get me wrong, but so many people don't realize kind of how their shoulders move. So they end up putting themselves at pretty high risk. Mm -hmm. well, correct me if I'm wrong. And I only know this from looking at the fibers and cadavers, but the sure. upper traps actually are more of a row because the fibers run mm -hmm. this way. Mm -hmm. The shrugs are actually middle and lower, like you're saying. That's an yeah. upper. So most guys yeah. that want big upper tracks do shrugs and that's actually not the movement to hit them. Yeah. We have a rows, portion of our upper traps rows. that actually attaches at the clavicle at the yeah. front. So yeah. that means it's, it's actually trying to, to figure out how to get forward. So yeah. we kind of get kind of biased to like, Oh, I picked up dumbbells when I was a kid and I put, you know, picked up a bar and I shrugged and, you know, that's when you saw the guys trying to like rotate because you can't go anywhere. Like the, the, the defining, like the arms pinned to your side because the load is pinned there or your grip is pinned there it's kind of like the most limited like okay i can barely go anywhere you don't really feel a huge amount of so then guys put oh put more weight put more weight put more weight mm -hmm. right and then they don't realize why they start clipping a labrum in their in their shoulder or stuff like that I'm like well because you're you don't even realize what's happening inside you know as you're going up and around the, the glenoids being driven downwards by the load and then you wonder why you wear out the bottom of your humerus right so yeah no it's it's like that humor starts to rub and the label starts to tear it's like oh yeah too many shrugs mm -hmm. right um so last thing on that eric what do you think are the exercises that you must do for back let's say top five things you absolutely have to do for back you gotta shrug you gotta do you again i'm kind of gonna repeat myself you gotta yeah. shrug back extension yeah you gotta shrug from different hip directions hinge. right yep. I, I, you gotta do some hip hinging type stuff um to help understand you know like how my lower back is supposed to work right and and involved and then i i just rotate the tires just I, everybody's gonna love a high row it's the easiest one to kind of feel, but a low to high row is this one that most people just sort of throw away because it's the shortest range you're going to do. And most people don't think of actually coming up to, to the, like they, they're not, they're kind of thinking lats equals down, everything to do with down, lats equals down. So you have to pull down. I'm like, well, only when the load is above you, are you going to pull down? If the load is below you, you have to actually oppose it by actually pulling like up and back which is where most people are thinking how do i find my thoracic lat i'm like up and back it's literally like sitting there for you but people throw it away because it's not a comfortable movement for them they don't move a big right a high to low is a huge range the low to high is a much shorter range so they don't they don't know what to feel for so they just oh this feels like it bunches up and so what's the best trying exercise? to drag the handles down yeah. what's the best exercise for like a low to high like lat focus row, just like a machine, like where you're pulling. Yeah, you use a machine. I've seen people, you know, when you're doing the sort of uh, like a dumbbell, if you don't have a machine that does it, if you're doing a dumbbell, uh, uh, if you're doing a cable row, right, and you're just like you're in kind of a, a, a position um, where you're, again, set up below it, you're going to have to think the cables, the only thing I resist, it's not you know, oh, I got to pull back. It's like, no, no, the, the cable's the, the challenge. If you have machines that'll do it, great. If you don't, 
even if you see guys do um, this kind of went through the Bible community, we see them kind of doing a bent over dumbbell row and they're kind of swinging the dumbbell. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Like they're doing a kind of a, like a drag on the dumbbell when they row it. That's an attempt to try and get there too. Right. So, you know, I've seen people kind of construct it. Yeah. Like an arc, right. Yeah. And, and pure, we have that, that one arced machine with kind of a row. Uh, you got a kind of a long arm to kind of pull, but remember, you're just paying attention to, to where's the force coming at me. And so guys, again, think like row, like anyway, my back has to be something going down. I'm like, but the machine is in front of you and on the ground. How are you going to try and go down from there? Right. That's when you see everybody sort of leaning over sideways, trying to figure out how to make it fit. All right. <laughs> yeah. See that all the time. Um, so, okay. So talking about what is, you know, so for weak body parts, what are the main things that you would want to focus on when you're trying to bring up a weak body part? You know, is it, is it frequency? Is it just the technique that we're focusing on? Is it, you know, yeah. prioritizing feel. some sort of, you know, crazy? I would, say feel. Routine or... I would feel, I would feel, I would say feel more than anything else. If you can't, you can't understand how to contract something. Now it's kind of funny in my mind, the bodybuilding community falls back and forth with the, with just the athletic community because the athletic community just wants to move stuff. Mm -hmm. right they're really good at moving stuff and so if i move a lot of weight I, you know they're doing work don't get me wrong but they're, they kind of don't care because when somebody says go tackle that guy they don't say how do i do it they just go tackle the guy right you know run away from that guy or run to that guy so or, or you know score the goal nobody cares how you did it right and so bodybuilding is literally standing on stage and contracting stuff controlling stuff to me it seems like the most natural thing to say posing is my muscle connection right posing and control is my muscle connection so why do we not think that some type of connectivity to to movement and trying to contract the stuff you want to contract is is relatable to how am i going to create some growth from that make sense right and, yeah. and obviously controlling through range full range of motion gets a little bizarre for people because again we go down this road of you know are you going to produce growth from that and maybe you're just going to produce skill right yeah. you know maybe partials you know is a garbage rep for a high level bodybuilder maybe it's a skill thing for a lower level person right there's mm -hmm. there's a couple different things because they go i only want to do five reps i'm like you could have done 15 you you wasted that thinking the number five is important i'm like no no the <laughs> get yourself to a high level of stress where you've got just five left. That's just something you don't understand. And so if I said lagging body, body part and you don't understand stress and you don't understand feel and you don't understand skill, you know, that's probably why you have a lagging body part. Right. So, we're, so we're looking at taking an athlete who let's say he does a bench press or any kind of press, he's shoulder tricep dominant, but you know, he wants to bring up his chest. So now we're doing the same things, but we're probably even lightening the load because we're trying to have him shift that tension, time under tension, whatever you want to call it, mechanical overload to that pack and not have mm -hmm. the shoulders and the triceps. So that might even be shifting exercises. That might be changing technique. So there's lots of ways we could we could do that, but that's that makes a lot of sense. That's what you're saying is we yeah. just want to have that mind-muscle connection shift. So when the person is doing that exercise, they're actually able to elicit that stimulus, that response, so that muscle starts to grow as opposed to something else taking over. Yeah, you also have somebody that might, let's say something silly like bench press, right? You know, for bodybuilders, I'm like, this is almost no relevance, but whatever. Somebody gets really good at bench press, meaning they move a lot of load. And then you say, we're going to try and break that down so that you don't, you know, I, I'd almost be like, man, it's easier to like ride another horse than it is to try and change what they feel is already successful because they can move a lot of load. Like it's very challenging to take a successful athlete at one thing and say, we're going to wipe that off the table and we're going to rebuild or redo this and somehow think he's going to come up with a different strategy that he's not as good at. Does that make sense? Like I would find maybe you come back to that well later once they actually have some sense of peck versus I just know I can move a lot of load and my arms seem, seem to get bigger. I'm moving a lot of load and my, my shoulders are getting bigger but I'm moving a lot of load and it's, I would almost be, okay, let's ride another horse. I'm going to put you in a whole other thing uh, till you understand how to contract your pec before I go back to trying to rework and build bench press into something that they finally feel in their pecs, you know? Yes. That makes sense. Okay. Um, let's see if we got any more questions here. We'll, we'll try to wrap things up pretty soon. Sure, man. 
Um, okay. What about someone who has a herniated disc? They want to they want to deadlift, they want to do squats. Um well, basically that's what they're asking. Should I squat or not if I have a herniated disc? Well, how herniated and what disc? Yeah, what level? <laughs> I mean, yeah, the different discs affect different nerve. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, probably, I mean, you know, the general answer would probably be not unless his unless his physician told him gave him clearance to do so yeah yeah i mean i would always err on uh, ask your doctor yeah yeah someone else is liable I, like i'm uh, not i'm not your doctor so yeah the idea when you get those questions and somebody asks you you know if i have a hernia disc i'm like what well, who's that who's in front of me right now I, nobody's yeah. in front of me right now and yeah. so if i'd said that somebody has gone to the trouble of confirming a herniated disc and then you say, I don't even know what level, I don't know what level bodybuilder, I don't know what is the history of injuries on this person, you know, all they have dysfunctional ankles, you know, one dysfunctional ankle, but they got, it's like, sure, squatting's great, you know, <laughs> I'm going to say no, that's probably, how did they get the herniation is another set of questions, right? Did they herniate their disc squatting? <laughs> uh, I would say, you know, that's not necessarily an awesome, there's probably some mistake, you know, some mistake is being replicated already. If they said I had a car accident and, you know, I had herniated disc, uh, are you in pain? Uh, zero pain, zero whatever, still a herniated disc. I found it on an MRI that, you know, somebody did and now I'm scared about deadlifting. But I've been deadlifting this entire time with no pain. I'd be like, oh, okay, well, it sounds like you've been doing okay. <laughs> you know, it hasn't continued. We're going to have to monitor. I mean, there's just so many so many questions uh that there's no absolute answer to that right it's sort of yeah. such an open-ended thing for sure yeah i was gonna say you know probably with this guy or with this person asking deadlift and squats they probably want to build their back and legs but i would just say you know like what you guys said why you know why, why would you be wanting to do deadlift and squat when we can do different exercises better, different exercises better exercises than... anyway yeah yeah so yeah there's probably supported things and you know, now again, we go back to the guy with the bench press that doesn't want to let go of his bench press. You know, squats and deadlifts and bench press are sitting in that powerlifting world of, you know, you're never going to get big unless you do the big three. And, you know, I'm like, okay, if we're still back there, um, you know, I might have to find a way to work around it. You know what I mean? Right. If he's still yeah. committed, or I might say, look, man, I don't think it's responsible to, to as a coach, to tell you to do something that puts you further at risk yeah um, yeah it's like still it's make like, those choices it's like okay well it's probably not on my watch mm -hmm. yeah i mean it, it's like the conversation where people will ask you know do you have to deadlift do you have to bench do you have to squat to get big no. the answer is obviously no but i think you know if you're not injured you're a beginner then why the heck wouldn't you be doing those exercises you know mm -hmm. and then and then again it's like then you get to a different point in your career different goals because we don't know anything about this guy. So why is he deadlifting? Why is he squatting? You know, if, if is he a power lifter? Right, exactly. Doesn't need mm -hmm. to do those three movements. No, I, but like what you just said was a perfect example of what I was talking about training before. So there's different stages in your training life, right? When you start, you should be benching and squatting and deadlifting. And then depending on where you take that hobby or sport or profession is going to dictate what exercises you end up with. But I, I think when you're new, you should absolutely learn how to do those things. Oh, yeah. They can teach you coordination, teaches you need some basic level of strength, right? But like, I don't know the last time I actually deadlifted. I might do RDLs, but like I have no interest in deadlifting. I think it doesn't help me do anything. Yeah. <laughs> Get a hernia. Last one for you, Eric. When are you going to make your YouTube channel? I've learned so many things from his videos and love your knowledge. <laughs> I'm about the farthest thing from a from a techno anything. So <laughs> I, have to, I it, it's something people keep asking for. It's something that I'm I'm just not. It's not high on my radar. You know what I mean, right? I, I'm doing my best to help whoever's in front of me. And thanks whoever sent that message. Thanks for uh, the vote of confidence <laughs> for doing something like that. Um, I'm glad to hear that people are getting information and and you know getting something out of what, what I'm putting out there. I think that's awesome. Um, maybe sometime in the future. We'll see. And plus we're doing videos on my YouTube channel. I've got Eric coming on. We're going to be doing another video this week, Eric on Friday, filming with big three media for oh, nice. our chest day. So nice for now, you can more, bench, find more bench press, more bench press stuff. Yeah. So <laughs> for now you can definitely find Eric on my YouTube channel, but you've also got lots of videos out there, Eric with 
many different other guys, you know, Gigi mm-hmm. Mufu you've done, Dorian Hamilton, he's got videos with you, Ben Pakulski, there's a bunch of guys out there. So, you I know, I haven't got one with Mo yet. I got to get one with Mo. We don't, I thought we don't have one with Dorian. No, we didn't. We nobody filmed that. Oh, right. Yeah. You yeah. just died. You just died during that workout. <laughs> we, put in a, we put on a solid week there. That was, what was that like back in like 21, maybe 22? Yeah. 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 yeah we got to link up again soon. Yeah. Yeah. Guaranteed to have that that chest looking purple by the time so pumped <laughs> by the time you're done with that workout. Yeah, no, I, I honestly do want to get in with some for some shoulders and back, uh, for sure. So we'll we'll arrange that. Yeah, yeah, go. yeah. That'd be awesome. We'll we'll do a Canadian beef one with Eric then soon. That'll be join awesome. the join the join the Robin uh, effect. There yeah. you go. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll do. There you go. We'll, and we'll put it on uh, the YouTube channel. That'd be great. Hundred percent. Yeah, for sure. All right. All right. Well, uh, thank you so much, Eric. Really appreciate your time and all your knowledge coming on today. Kurt, like, yeah. also really appreciate you as well, brother. Um, yeah. Mo, as always. Um, yeah. Eric, before we head off, um, how can we find you um, if people want to work with you? Uh, I'm on Instagram at core muscle activation. I think it's an underscore in there somewhere or whatever. Yep. Um, Generally, yeah, people just in the Toronto area for sure. If they want to look me up and find me, you know, I'm Google done. <laughs> and I'll also put all your Google information in the show problem. notes too. Yeah. yeah. See, internet. I don't know, man. Just find me. <laughs> just Google Eric Seifert. You'll find him. Yeah. I got him. It's, it's, it's core underscore like muscle that. underscore activation. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. I just started following you. Or, or you can oh, do what man. I did. I, I went down to Tampa. To try to find you eric but then you weren't in tampa <laughs> <laughs> so then i came back to canada and then you ended up right here <laughs> i know i was in tampa at some point and then i was yeah. somewhere else and i was somewhere yeah. else you know right i know i know okay yeah. thank you so much guys guys thank you so much it was real yeah. great thanks for coming on guys appreciate it yeah. make sure you subscribe to the channel we'll see you guys next time